is Rob Heidemann. I'm from uh, UCL in London. I'd like to introduce my uh, co-chair, Tazoma Masula, from the College of Medicine at the University of uh, Malawi. We are chairing the Right Shot vaccine session, the second of these uh, sessions. I think we have a, a great set of speakers who are all going to keep to time, which will allow you to ask your questions. We're going to take questions after each uh, speaker. The first speaker is Ravi Mishra, who's going to be talking about the uh, preclinical imaginicity uh, of uh, his new conjugate vaccine. Ravi. Uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak on this uh, conference. So uh, my today talk is on the preclinical immunity of typhoid and paratyphoid conjugate vaccine uh, in, the, in the different animal models. So I would like to highlight that this, uh, the data of this presentation is coming from biologically and GH uh, uh, joint project of bivalent and typhoid monovalent uh, vaccine uh, development project. So I will be speaking about one of the uh, uh, pre immunogenicity data uh, related to this. So uh, the outline of my presentation is uh, I will go with the uh, short uh, background. So we had uh, a lot of um, excellent presentations yesterday and today on the epidemiology, history, and other things. So I will not take much time on that. And there will be a quick review on the what are the proof of concept has been uh, established uh, to uh, for the VI and uh, O2 based uh, vaccines. So I will take a quick review of that. And then I will be speaking about the biologically approach uh, that uh, how we are going to, uh, how we have developed the bivalent vaccine. And then I will be speaking of a couple of data on the, uh, in the mice as well as the rabbit and uh, uh, where we are, the current status of the project. So uh, to start with the brief uh, introduction, of um, uh, Salmonella paratyphi, which is uh, cause of enteric uh, fever. So basically, the enteric fever is caused by uh, both the pathogens, Salmonella typhi and paratyphi. And uh, there are a significant number of cases everywhere is reported. So it is responsible for a, a significant number of morbidity and mortality throughout the year. Uh, both the pathogen causes the similar symptoms, similar disease, so it's uh, sometimes uh, difficult to distinguish between them. Sometimes uh, in the enteric fever, the paratyphi uh, contribution is uh, 20, 20, 30 percent, so there was uh, many presentation on that. Uh, the disease, is the peak case of disease is reported one to three years, and uh, it, was, it is reported that the paratyphi is one of the leading causes. Uh, of enteric fever after, uh, after styphy. Also, the, another thing, there was uh, many excellent presentation on the uh, emerging antibiotic race, and that is another concern which, uh, which is very important things to be addressed. Uh, on the top of that, there is, uh, there is no vaccine to prevent the paratyphy. There are a couple of conjugate vaccine for the typhoid uh, conjugate vaccine, but there is no vaccine to prevent paratyphy. Uh, and the ideal situation would be think that um, if there is a vaccine that can prevent both the illness, both the pathogen, uh, typhi as well as para typhi, that will be the ideal situation. So uh, just to a quick introduction of the what are the antigens uh, which are a part of the bivalent vaccine. So basically there are three major antigens in salmonella. VI, which is a surface polysaccharide uh, of salmonella typhi. Uh, the O2, uh, O antigen, which is, uh, which is a somatic antigen and part of um, LPH uh, of uh, paratyphi A, and there is uh, H antigen. So there are uh, a number of, um, number of uh, literatures, number of findings that uh, highlights the crucial role of VI uh, and O2 in the pathogenesis of salmonella typhi and paratyphi. So this was the <coughs> This was the region, this was the uh, base for the taking, selecting these antigen as, a, as our vaccine components. So this is just a quick review of the what are the proof of concept have been done uh, in the past. So in the left panel, there is a pioneer study uh, which was done to show that uh, VI is uh, an important immunogen 
uh, for uh, salmonella typhi. So there was a conjugate which VI EPA was used to immunize the mice and it was known to be immunogenic. And on the right side you see there's another publication from uh, JVJ's group which shows that uh, VI CRIM conjugate uh, which was uh, used in the preclinical immunization in the mice and shown to be the immunogenic. So this confirms the role of the VI and there are many more uh, publications on that also on the, in the, in, as, a, as a vaccine antigen. So there is another, uh, on the other side of the O2, there is another publication uh, where uh, they have shown that the O2 is an important antigen and it is immunogenic in mice. So these are the things which uh, was uh, taken as a kind of proof of concept. So this is the overall strategy what biologically has used in collaboration with GBGH. Uh, so this, is, this was a long journey, long development process to right from the, the core technology from the GBGS to the process optimization for production of the VI and O2 at biologically and uh, is, it is scale up for the uh, as a manufacturing. So the VIA uh, was produced from Citrobacter and it was conjugated with uh, CRM197 to generate VIA cream monovalent. On the other side, O2 polysaccharide was produced from Salmonella parat IFA and conjugated to cream to generate O2 cream. And these two monovalent were uh, mixed together in equal proportion uh, and used for the immunization, immunization is in different models. So this is the uh, model which we have used. Uh, so this is uh, the data I'm presenting is uh, one of the many experiments. Uh, so the uh, immunization schedule which we have used is uh, here. In the left panel, I'm showing that. So there were three injections. So first in day one, uh, and after that, uh, second injection at four weeks apart, and the third one at, uh, after two weeks of the second. Uh, so the sera was collected from uh, post one, post two, and post three, and Elijah was done to evaluate the <coughs> anti-VI and N2O2 antibodies. So we have used uh, in the mice, we have used one tenth of uh, current hum single human dose uh, of the vaccine, and in the rabbit we have used a single uh, human dose of vaccine with the subcutaneous root. So uh, in the right panel, I'm showing that the, the vaccine combinations, vaccines uh, we have used for the immunization. So there was a, uh, there was a bivalent, which is comprised of VI cream and O2 cream. And that is, uh, um, and then we have kept the individual monovalent as well as the controls on conjugated polysaccharide. So the NTVI and N2O2 uh, IgG was measured in the respective groups. So, so this is the first data uh, set is on the NTVI response in the mice. So there are three groups, uh, color groups of the, um, uh, the bars, which, uh, which are for the three different uh, time points. So P1, P2, P3 represent the three different time points. So the control was the unconjugated polysaccharide. So if you see in the uh, red bar, there is a, uh, this is the monovalent conjugate, which, which is quite good immunogenic. And there was also a secondary immune response has been seen when, when it was boosted at the four. Uh, the important thing when it was used as a component of bivalent, where VI and O2 both were present, also we can see the similar response of, against the anti-VI uh, in mice. The similar data we have uh, seen in the rabbit uh, for the O2 as well in the mice. So, uh, if you see the red bars, this is the individual monovalent, and the green bar is the bivalent, which is having the, both the, both the uh, conjugate vaccine. So there was a quite good response uh, uh, in seeing the, uh, after immunization, and this uh, response uh, was boosted. Actually, it's a, it's a, it generated a secondary immune response when we boost it uh, at, the, at the day 29. Uh, and the other model which we, was, we used, the rabbit, we have got the similar, uh, so this was the data, again, it was confirmed in the a different model, and we have got the similar train. So uh, it's in the individual uh, monovalent giving the good response when we are putting in the, the combination, there is a, the response is the similar. And the same thing was for the O2. So the two, three important points I would like to highlight here that uh, the, the vaccine as such, it's showing um, the good immune response, 
uh, first. The second thing is that we are seeing a, a, a secondary immune response when we are, uh, we are giving a second dose. Uh, we are seeing a very good uh, secondary immune response. And the important point, uh, when we are putting the, both, the, both the conjugates in the, in the bivalent, there was no interference seen in the, in the antibody. So if you see the monovalent as well as the bivalent, we are seeing the same level of. So there is no, so that's, this is important for a combination vaccine that we are not getting any interference between the, both the components, both the antibodies. So this, I would like to uh, conclude with this. So we have a novel bivalent conjugate vaccine containing VIN O2 polysaccharide, which was developed in collaboration with GBGS and found to be immunogenic uh, in different animal models. No interference we have seen between the anti-VI and O2 antibodies. So when we put in the bivalent combination. So uh, we have done a lot of uh, development work. So now we are at the at the very end of the development, and we are ready to do the preclinical toxicology. And after that uh, preclinical, uh, the plan is to do the uh, joint clinical program with the GBGs. So that's, that's the thing. So that's the end of my presentation. I would like to thanks to my team at Balaskali and the GBGs team, as well as the Sabin Institute for the Travel Award. Thank you very much for this. Okay, so this presentation is now open to uh, questions. While people are sort of formulating their questions, how essential, um, Ravi, how essential do you think uh, it is to have the two components of the vaccine for the bivalent vaccine? How essential do you think it is to have the two components of the vaccine? I mean, uh, for, the, for the bivalent, I mean, if you see the data, there's a significant number of uh, paratyphy, typhoid cases or uh, there, so it's, uh, it will be kind of the approach which will cannibalize, I would say, that uh, the, our monovalent program. Like we already have a monovalent uh, program, so this will be the next uh, <coughs> thing which will be coming into. Any other questions? No? Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Now we're going to invite um, Chialunka Brehi from Fondacion Achilles Cravo. The title of the talk is Development of a Sustainable and Effective Vaccine Against Invasive Nine Typhoid Salmonellosis in Africa. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you also for the organization for inviting me here and for the support provided. Uh, my presentation is going to be sort of different from what you have seen until now because I guess it's more of a case study of, for a collaboration rather than a technical presentation that I'm, I'm really not up qualified to do. But in any case, uh, we will be talking about the development of a sustainable and effective vaccine against inf invasive non typhoidal salmonellosis in Africa. Uh, let me give a couple, uh, just a slide on the foundation because not everybody may be quite familiar with the foundation and you'll understand where we're coming from and why we're doing what we're doing. So it was established in 2011 by private founders, the Sclavo Vaccine Association and Rino Rapuoli on his own right who actually put his funds as, as endowment fund for the foundation. It's a not-for-profit organization carrying out scientific research and training in support of counties in need. The board of directors, besides Reno, that I think most of you know, also has the chairman who's the chair of the UN SDSN Assembly and SDSN MED, and uh, Dr. Malvolt, the former Gavian PATH officer. Our mission is to reduce infant mortality in low-income countries by accelerating availability of new affordable, life-saving vaccines against neglected infectious diseases and training local doctors, thereby reducing poverty. Just one word on the training. Uh, the Fondazione is also coordinating from this year the fifth edition of the Master in Vaccinology and Pharmaceutical Clinical Development that is offered by University of Siena to uh, medical doctors coming from low middle income countries and is supported by a, a very distinguished group of uh, uh, stakeholders. Actually, one of the alumni is here in the audience and is already contributing to the fight against enteric diseases. The foundation and its activity, core activity started looking at uh, uh, 
charts like this. So uh, the mortality has been, infant mortality has been down, going, down, going down substantially. In Africa still remains a major problem, as you can see in the blue and the orange stripes. And among the major infectious diseases, they are little enteric and then enteric diseases are still a major problem. So what, what did we say? What we can, how can we reduce the number of deaths caused by enteric diseases by facilitating development and uptake of the most needed vaccines that are technically feasibly but unfunded? What Reno thought was, okay, let's look you know, from uh, a vaccinologist experience to see what are the needed vaccines that can also be developed at a sustainable cost using the existing technologies. Already. So you don't have to invent a vaccine against HIV, but there is technology already to do something. And then let's attract, attract the funds and put them on this development, therefore anticipating the impact and reducing that big, steep number of deaths that we still have there. This model was already uh, applied, uh, and we uh, successfully supported phase one and two A for the typhoid conjugate that was just presented by Ravi. Um, INTS was, is another uh, disease that we've working, been working on for the last few years, and uh, uh, <coughs> the last two years have seen a lot of uh, uh, work on the epidemiology that unfortunately has given a much better picture of what the burden of this disease is. And if you look at this picture, you understand, before, I mean, you couldn't think what was the average number of deaths. It was more than typhoid, less than typhoid. We've got three applications turned down by European uh, funders because they say, well, we don't know the epidemiology. We don't know if it's a problem. And you know, that has been a great frustration for us because we knew from the evidence, like the one that Carl presented, for example, that there was a lot of disease. We just couldn't prove it. So the disease burden is estimated worldwide. This already has been seen, said, to 3.4 million illnesses and up to 681,000 fatalities. The majority of morbidity and mortality, unfortunately, is in Africa, with the case fatality rates that really is boosting number of deaths in an incredible way. Is the leading cause of sepsis in Africa. Is a major cause of under five mortality in fragile categories like uh, uh, people also affected by malaria, young children that are anemic or malnourished. And uh, there is an increase in persisting antibiotic resistance at stage generic, so that I won't, I won't make any mistake. And it's difficult to diagnose. Uh, if you want to say something more about this, uh, the, uh, the epidemiology in Africa, please go and look at the post, a very nice post that Val Uche, who is the, our former uh, master student, is presenting upstairs. So INTS disease today can be treated and in part prevented. Public hygiene interventions are crucial. They've been the, defined and described very well this morning, uh, but uh, they cannot eliminate the disease that will re be really effective long term, although we already see the, their effect. Looking at prevention, of course, vaccination has been indicated also in the literature as one uh, high priority, also considering the uncertainties regarding the reservoir and the modes of transmission. Fortunately, vaccine developments, as we have seen, are, are, are ongoing, uh, but no va licensed vaccines are available or close to licensing and funding, as we've been saying, as I said before, is an issue. Hopefully, it will be easier to drag some more funds on it. So the Afri S Africa project is this collaboration that we are um, running in, uh, in Siena is an initiative to attract funding and attention on these neglected diseases of disadvantaged groups and population. Has been approved and co-financed finally by a public small public organization, but they understood the, the, the problem and they've seen they've done already a good job with typhoid, so they trusted us. They gave us a two-year grant, over one million, that started in September. The partnership includes two not-for-profit organizations, ourselves and the University of Siena, and two private partners that actually fully fund their work. One is GSK Vaccine Institute for Global Health that has been working very, very well on the, on the vaccine, and this the Medeiri, the small medium company that works on the assays. This is the collaborative network against INTS in Siena. 
the goal is to accelerate development and availability of an effective GEMMA-based vaccine against the deadly neglected disease endemic in Africa at risk for antibiotic uh, resistance, which is actually already say, in, in place now. I won't say anything on the GEMMA because the next presentation will be exactly giving all the details you may want to know about that. Uh, what are the objectives? Uh, so, uh, prepare and update an epidemiological and disease model for INTS disease in Africa. Do a pharmacoeconomic study for sustainable vaccine deployment. Support preclinical activities accelerating phase one. Profiling vaccines mucosal and cellular immunological response in uh, preclinical infection models qualification and validation of immunoassays. If you look at what the foundation has to do, this is pretty transversal uh, project. So we go from scientific coordination, which is done by Reno himself, to the dissemination of the results, and that's why I'm also here today. Uh, there is support of the clinical activities. There is the co-funding that we need to do, the board burden of disease modeling for pharmacoeconomic and sustainability modeling. We want to start early. I think we need to learn also from what we've been doing on typhoid that you know, so much time elapsed by the time that we understood the problem, we started to get organized, understand what is the burden of disease. We may want to start doing that a little bit earlier because there are 681,000 people dying every day from this bug. So, uh, the epidemiologic and burden of disease models uh, will be built together with the uh, uh, University of Siena Schools of Economics. Uh, um, we've been updating the models, that uh, the, the literature that Val had already prepared before. The model is going to be challenging, but we have people coming that have already that experience. We still found the usual problems of lack of peer-reviewed data, incomplete or duplicate information, and some difficulty in making correct diagnosis. So we appreciate any information that we can share on these points. Summary conclusion. So INTS is the major cause of bloodstream infection in sub-Saharan Africa. It's a major burden for disadvantaged groups and populations. A case fatality ratio, which I think is, is astonishing, and the 19, 20% may be a conservative figure. Transmission routes are unclear, uh, and this makes it even more difficult to prevent and control. Antibiotic resistance has already been mentioned by people much more qualified than me to say how much that is a problem. Uh, the most eff more effective prevention measures are needed, no vaccine are is available yet. Uh, we hope with our project to bring a sustainable vaccine to be phase one ready, and this will happen within the next year, next 12 months, and also already model his introduction in Africa to fight the disease. This also because, like meningitis in the past, the, the epidemiology is not solid epidemiology, but you have to go by country, by WHO area, etc. So that's something we start building to be ready in the future to add whatever else is coming uh, uh, available as well. We are also searching, and I will take this opportunity to ask since I'm up here and I have the microphone, so I'm going to take advantage. We are searching for support to continue the work we're doing on the vaccines and the board of this burden of disease and economic analysis. Many thanks again to the uh, Coalition Against Typhoid for supporting us, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you for the presentation, Jalunka. Now it's going to take questions. As you're thinking about your questions, uh, Jalunka, uh, there are a number of activities that you need to do in order to meet your, there are a number of objectives which you have mentioned. Um, one of them is determining the burden. How do you think that is going to affect your overall objectives? The burden of disease, you mean? Yes. Well, for that, we have been uh, doing a very careful analysis of the literature that available, is available. 
there have been very important and very well done contributions the last two, two or three years. Then we will have, with the help of anybody who can help, put together this burden of disease and cost of disease analysis, because that will be something that will start also driving future intervention. Again, I don't believe, again, I don't believe it's going to be the final, but we definitely have to start going through some modeling, because what INTS was really missing until a couple of years ago was to have even a, you know, an idea a published uh, and uh, recognized, etc., of its burden. What we need to do is to work more on that to make people even more aware, because I think in Africa there is more than that. And I think most of the people in here believe that. So we must be ready to get that information, factor them in, and say this is actually what this bug is costing us. It's costing the people in Africa and everybody else who is working on, uh, on this disease. I'm slightly worried that uh, people have eaten too much matoki over lunch and are starting to uh, uh, fall asleep. Do ask questions, uh, um, audience, so we'd love to uh, be sure that you're still awake. Um, uh, just while we're waiting for other people to ask questions, can I ask, what uh, age group are you going to be targeting these, this vaccine at? Because Cal McLennan and uh, Tony Narenda in a separate study have demonstrated uh, maternal antibodies in, in young infants. And so how are you going to get over quite high levels of maternal antibody potentially blocking vaccine effects? Yes. That's a, a question that goes more into, I think, the, the, the next presentation that uh, we're talking about more of the vaccine experts. I'm, I, I'm an MBA, so you know, <laughs> I can talk about GMTs, but I'm not exactly the right person to give the best answer. Uh, nevertheless, that will be one of the elements that we'll be putting in our analysis, because to me, this has similarities again with the uh, meningitis vaccine program and I think you know that's something that we want to think keep in mind because there will, could be different vaccination strategies because there is an epidemic in my view because it's cast, you know 300,000 deaths in Africa it's an epidemic if you want to call it that way it may not be maybe correct but that's the reality and of the matter All right. okay. yeah please Ask. There we go. So just to answer that question, uh, the GVGH target product profile. That's to keep you awake. <laughs> well, you did want to wake up. So um, the GVGH target product profile based on the current epidemiology would be delivery with the six week EPI program. Got it. OK, thank you. So thank you very much indeed, John. Okay, so uh, next up we have uh, Oliver uh, Kobling from GSK Vaccines Institute for Global Health. And uh, Oliver is going to take on this uh, narrative through to the vaccine itself. So, Oliver. Thank you, Rob. And thank you also um, for the opportunity to present our data here at this uh, conference. Let me just briefly say a few words about our institute, GVGH. It is located in the beautiful town of Siena on the same, in Italy on the same campus as GSK Vaccines. And, but it's actually a separate legal entity from GSK Vaccines. And our model is to actively seek partners to fund activities, particularly at the stages of development and clinical trials. Now you've heard a lot about um, the epidemiology and the burden of disease in Africa. Let me just add one more you know, set of data that I show you here. Now from literature search, we have identified upper and lower estimates of INTS deaths, and that's identified in children in Africa. And that ranged between 50,000 and 250,000 per year. This is the red bar on the left. And we compared it to deaths in all age groups caused by um, lower respiratory infections, diarrheal infections, and neglected tropical diseases. And these are data from the GBD 2015, again for Africa. And what you see is basically that when we take the upper level, that the deaths caused by INTS are only exceeded by deaths caused by HIV, malaria, and pneumonia. So, and it's far above 
I can continue. <laughs> and it's far above the deaths caused by um, lower respiratory infections and neglected tropical diseases. On the next slide, we have a map from Africa. Can we have the slides back? Thank you. That shows <laughs> countries. We are on slide four. Hey. Okay. Here you see a map from Africa that shows countries where INTS isolates from blood uh, have been reported, and you see it's actually all over Africa. And this, I take this, I have taken this from a poster from Val Uche, and um, he has more data on this, and I can, o can only recommend to stop by and look at it further. As we have seen, almost all cases are caused by serovars that express DO antigen 045 or 9 and we have also learned that in Africa these are specific human adapted uh, clades. And multi drug resistant is a problem, we have also heard this before. So it's really an effective and affordable INTS vaccine that can save many lives. Our approach, our vaccine approach, as, Luca, uh, as Gianluca um, introduced, is based on Gemma. Now, what is a Gemma? The approach takes the advantage um, of the fact that gram-negative bacteria naturally can release small portions of the outer membrane. And what we do is we genetically break the linkages between the outer membrane and the underlying uh, and, the, and the layers below which then re results in massive release of those outer membrane, oops, of these outer membrane blabs that we call the Gemma. Why is it such an attractive um, approach? So the Gemma is just the outer layer of the bacteria, and that's what you need. That's where the antigens are in. And the antigens are presented in the native environment for optimal immune immunogenicity and we can engineer the strains um, further genetically to allow targeted vaccine design. We can delete other antigens, we can delete or we can insert also other antigens based on the need. It is simple and affordable to manufacture. Um, the Gemma do not require any further chemical modifications and that's an advantage. And we applied this technology to different pathogens such as Shigella, the meningococcus, and also the Salmonella. Now in the Salmonella Gemma, it's actually what we have seen, the O-antigen that constitutes the active component and induces the production of uh, functional antibodies in mice. And we know that uh, between the O4, 5, and the O9, the sugar composition is slightly different which also determines then the um, specificity of the antibodies. So our approach is a bivalent formulation of Typhimurium gemma with the 045 O antigen and Enteritidis gemma with the 09 antigen, um, 09 O antigen that has the, actually the potential to protect against the vast majority of INTS cases in Africa. <coughs> we have also developed a, a manufacturing process that is generic, simple and robust. So we selected suitable Typhimurium and Enteritidis production strains, introduced genetic modifications to induce the massive release of these Gemma, and we also <coughs> modified the LPS, and I will talk about this in a minute. And the production is very simple. We ferment the strains and purify the Gemma just by two filtration processes, and then this, oops, And these are the, these are the Gemma, um, when you look at them at a, in an electron microscope. And then these are formulated um, on anhydrogel. And we also, uh, we already um, produced GMP lots of the Gemma from both strains that would be available. We have also um, developed a generic panel of Gemma release tests to characterize them. And just to give you an example, um, we've seen that the particle size uh, is around 100 nanometers for both, which is in the range of um, virus-like particles, and the O-antigen molecular size from them is, is 30 and 35 kilodalton, respectively. 
The antigen, as you know, is linked to the lipid A portion that's embedded in the membrane, and the lipid A is known to be able to induce pro-inflammatory cytokine responses, and we want to keep them uh, in an, in an at an acceptable level. So what we have done is we um, modified the lipid A by deleting the genes MSBB and PACP, which results in a purely penta-isolated lipid A uh, here, and uh, looked at the ability of the, uh, of the gemma with the um, mutant lipid A to induce uh, IL-6 release from human uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells. And you see this on the right. In blue are the gemma with the wild type lipid A. In yellow are the gemma with the mutant lipid A. And what this shift actually says is that the gemma with the mutant lipid A have 100-fold lower ability to stimulate IL-6 release than the gemma with the wild type lipid A. And even more important, these are similar to Shigella gemma that we already have tested in a phase one trial and they were well tolerated. So indicating that also the INTS gemma are, um, are suitable. We looked at immunogenicity in mice. Um, so we immunized mice with increasing concentration, uh, with in increasing doses of gemma, typhimurium or enteritidis gemma. This is based on the amount of O antigen and measured antibody responses against the typhimurium or the enteritidis O antigen. In this case, each dot represents the serum from a single mouse. And what you see is that we get a dose-response curve. All mice um, responded to the immunization, and um, at doses of less than one microgram, we already got a very high antibody response. And this is um, after the second immunization. When we look at the mixture of the two gemma, this is now, um, again, IgG ELISA data ag against the typhimurium or antigen on the left and against the enteritidis or antigen on the right. And what we see is that the bivalent formulation induces similarly high levels of um, antibodies as the monovalent um, formulation. So again, indicating that there is no evidence of interference between the two gemma uh, components when mixed together. And in this case, we immunized with only 160 nanograms of typhimurium or enteritidis gemma, either separately or in a combination, so very immunogenic. But are these uh, antibodies functional? And the short answer is yes, they are very functional. And we looked at this in a serum bactericidal assay against typhimurium and enteritidis strains. So again, you heard it yesterday, the assay um, basically uses live bacteria mixed with the serum and an external complement source. And again, on the left, you have the results with a typhimurium test strain. And what we see is again that the bivalent um, gemma induce very high antibody responses. And what these dots actually mean is that you can dilute the sera uh, more than one to 10,000 fold and they still kill the bacterium. And these antibody responses are similar to that, uh, to, to the one that we see with the monovalent gemma. And remarkably, when we use the enteritidis gemma, for example, they do not induce um, uh, cross-reactive antibodies, indicating that really the O antigen is the target. And we'll, when we look at the enteritidis uh, test strain, again, the bivalent formulation induces also against this strain high uh, SBA levels. So in conclusion, small quantities of the formulated bivalent gemma induce antibodies with high functional activity against both typhimurium and enteritidis. So from literature, we know there is a high burden of disease caused by INTS in Africa. We have the technology that is applicable to different vaccines suitable for low and middle income countries. It's a simple um, production process. The INTS uh, gemma in mice are very immunogenic and induce functional antibodies against typhimurium and enteritidis without evidence of interference. And our plan is now to proceed to a GLP toxicology study this year. So our preclinical pre -clinical data say that this approach uh, is very promising towards an effective and affordable vaccine against INTS disease. And we are actually ready for clinical uh, proof of concept now. 
Finally, I would like to thank um, the G current GVHH project team, the early uh, <coughs> development team, our um, collaborators from uh, the Fondazione Esclavo <coughs> and our funding agencies. And I thank you for your attention. We have a question. So thank you for the Bruce Gellin Sabin Vaccine Institute. It has a little bit of a sounds too good to be true quality. Um, my question is, would this apply, would a uh, science question, would this apply to Typhi? Could you have the same process platform for Typhi as well as the other two? Could be. Oh. Or maybe for typhoid? You, you want to answer that question, Laura? Is that? <laughs> well, let's say um, in, in, in general from the approach, it could be applicable. I mean, of course, if these strains, they target, they target INTS, they, the, our vaccine strains, they target INTS, but let's say in terms of the approach, we can, it could be applicable. But you haven't well. tried it to see side by side how it works with other vaccines? No, we haven't tried. Okay. And then you mentioned the word affordable, you mentioned the word sustainable. What does that mean? We say that um, from the, the, the strains that we generated, um, that they release high quantities of these vesicles, which makes the production uh, affordable. And because of the quantities that that uh, that these um, that the bacteria release. And I would add also considering the contribution that. Uh, funds coming from not-profit organizations there will be you know a lower burden on the net present value of the cost of the uh, of the development that of course would be impacting and in any case you know gvgh has a business model that allows that business funds are fund in are brought in to finalize relative clinical development and that of course lowers that big chunk of money that generally pharmaceuticals have on their early part of development that that weighs a lot on the final price. Cal. Thanks, Rob. Oliver, very nice presentation. Thank you. Two, two quick questions. Um, first one, uh, the figure with the immunogenicity was for 160 nanogra uh, nanograms, which was great for showing the strong immunogenicity. Um, can you just clarify that at the uh, sort of five microgram dose, you also had no interference. I'm sure you can. Uh, and the second question, um, have, you, have you yet mixed the vaccine with the VI conjugate and uh, tried that yet? Uh, the answer to the second question is no, we haven't tried. Um, the first question was, sorry, can you read? Oh, just, just to confirm, the, uh, you, you showed data for the 160 nanograms, and yes. just to confirm that at a, a higher dose, you know, that, that showed very nicely that how immunogenic the vaccine was, but at a higher, higher dose, you, just that you, you have no interference as well when you go up to five micrograms. Yes, exactly. So we have tested the combination also at, um, at, at 2.5 micrograms each, and we also did not see interference in this case. Yes. Thank you. So just to, to add to Cal's question briefly, um, we have not, as Oliver pointed out, evaluated a conjugate with the INTS Gemma. In the bivalent typhi paratyphi program, we did look at combining VI creme with a paratyphi Gemma, and in that situation, we saw no immunologic interference. So theoretically, it would be possible, but we don't have the data yet. Did you get immunological enhancements? We saw better antibody responses to the O component with the JAMA compared to the conjugate. We did not do sufficient studies to evaluate whether it is true immunologic enhancement and what that actually would mean. <laughs> but the concept is feasible. I have just one other question, and that is, do you have any sense about, of how many doses are going to be required for this vaccine? We don't know this yet at this stage. So from our Shigella data in humans, and this is um, phase one study of a Sony Gemma, which is 
just completed full vaccination in Kenya, but not, this data is based on our European studies. We get good antibody responses after both one and two vaccinations, but what would be used moving forward will be very much driven by the clinical data, and we have plans to look at that. Okay, if we have no more questions, thank you very much, Helen. All right, thank you. Uh, the next presentation is from Raphael Simon from the University of Maryland, and the title of the talk is Salmonella type Miriam Core or Polysaccharide Glycoconjugate with the homologous cell of a phase one flagellin as a vaccine to prevent invasive Salmonella type Miriam infections in sub Saharan Africa. Okay, well, I'd like to thank everyone for staying for this afternoon session and also for the organizers of this uh, meeting for allowing uh, the opportunity to present our work. So we've been discussing uh, over the last uh, day and a half uh, glycoconjugate vaccines and I thought it'd be useful to start with a brief overview of why they're important. So uh, the rationale for glycoconjugates, ordinarily and for most polysaccharides, uh, they are poorly immunogenic, fail in to uh, induce immunologic memory or functional boost. They're also, in kids under two, uh, essentially non-immunogenic. This can be overcome by conjugation of the polysaccharide to a, to a protein, which allows for T-cell help and overcomes many of the aforementioned uh, obstacles. Our glycoconjugate vaccine approach for uh, NTS is based on uh, conjugating the corn O polysaccharide of the lipopolysaccharide to the flagellin protein from the same serovar. Uh, as we would uh, j just discussed in the previous presentation, uh, the lipopolysaccharide is comprised by lipid A, which is linked to a core in KDO, which is conserved among serovars, and that in turn is linked to a variable repeat of uh, the O polysaccharide, which differs in structure between serogroups groups and is used uh, to define the sero group. For uh, generating our core and O polysaccharide, we uh, remove the, the core and O polysaccharide from the lipid A and uh, conjugate that to the flagellin through a variety of different ways uh, that we'll go into uh, in uh, later slides. In terms of the rationale for use as flagellin as the carrier protein, flagellin in this case, we use the flagellin, phase one flagellin from the same serovar with the idea that it's a pathogen relevant antigen. We published previously that uh, it gives protection both by active immunization uh, and also passive transfer of antibodies against flagellin to similarly protect uh, mice against fatal infection with uh, non-typhoidal salmonella. In previous iterations of this meeting, uh, we presented work for our glycoconjugate vaccine using this approach for Salmonella and Teriditis, where we'd identified an immunogenic and protective uh, formulation. And uh, for this talk, I'll discuss our work towards uh, a uh, partner vaccine um, for Salmonella type Miriam. So as a high-level overview for uh, our production strains for generating uh, the components for the corn O polysaccharide vaccine, uh, we start with a wild type uh, Salmonella type Miriam I-77, which is from Mali, and uh, this is work from Sharon Tenenano Group, uh, where it be, it's genetically engineered to be attenuated. Uh, and uh, for the middle uh, diagram, um, it's uh, attenuated, produces high amounts of uh, the carrier protein, which are exported as flagellin monomers, which allows for easy purification from the culture supernatant. She also deleted the gene for uh, the phase two flagellin, Fledge B, so we uh, um, have only the phase one flagellin purified exclusively. In terms of producing the polysaccharide heptin that we use for antigen, uh, we pursued a, a similar approach with a, a single addition, and uh, that strain CBD1925 is also transformed with the plasma that encodes the polysaccharide copolymerase protein WISB. When you overexpress WISB, you essentially shift all of the, the chain length of the O polysaccharide from a mixture to being exclusively long. Shown this in this slide is the molecular size analysis of the polysaccharides being used in the study. In the STS page for LPS on the left hand side is the starting strain CBD1925, which you can see is a mixture of short and some long O polysaccharide. When you overexpress WISB, you shift the population entirely to being long chain O polysaccharide, which provides a uniform uh, chain length. Uh, which is actually also optimal for, uh, for a conjugate vaccine development. Shown by HPLC SEC on the right-hand side is the purified corn O polysaccharide from, uh, from this strain, where you see it's a uniform long, uh, a high, long chain high molecular weight peak, which overlaps with uh, the corn O polysaccharide from our challenge strain um, used in the studies, which is D65, and it's a Malian invasive blood isolate. For that strain, you see the same long O polysaccharide population and additional uh, very long species. 
We confirmed uh, the identity and composition of uh, the O-polysaccharide biochemically. Shown in the top left-hand side is the general structure of Salmonella typhimurium O-polysaccharide, which is uh, similar to other Group B Salmonella OPSs. And the structure is a manos ramnos galactose backbone uh, trisaccharide epitope, which is conserved amongst Group A, B, and D Salmonella. Uh, that can become variably glucosylated at the galactose, which produces uh, what's known as epitope 1, which is also a common feature of A, B, and D serogroups. The uh, serogroup defining uh, saccharide is a dideoxyhexose that's linked to the mannose. Uh, in Salmonella typhimurium and other group Bs, that's an abacose. Presence of the abacose uh, imparts epitope 4 serologically. There are other, uh, um, uh, there's one additional recognized uh, serological um, uh, epitope modification. That is oacetylation of the abacose, which produces what's known as epitope 5. Uh, there's a second oacetyl group, which is actually common in strains from sub-Saharan Africa, and that's oacetylation of the ramnose. Uh, at present, there's no serological uh, classification, although that's uh, common in, uh, in most uh, strains and all the ones we looked at. So uh, shown uh, biochemically by proton NMR on the right-hand side, uh, we confirm that our 1925 uh, WISB uh, corn O-polysaccharide is variably oacetylated at both ramnose and abacose. Uh, a common feature of oacetyl groups is uh, pH sensitivity, so they're labile above approximately pH 8, and we confirmed this, and uh, we confirmed that when you go above pH 8, you uh, lose the oacetyls at approximately equal uh, rates from uh, both sites. So at pH 9, you get marked loss, and at pH 10 and 12, by proton NMR, there's no detectable residual oacetyl at those positions. We confirmed that uh, they were recognized by antigenically with monoclonal antibodies against O4 and O5. And uh, I would point out that the deoacetylated uh, species uh, using pH 10 will be important for subsequent parts of this talk where we use this uh, in several uh, ways. So uh, by interrogation with anti-O4, we see that the native and the deoacetylated species uh, retain that, that epitope, whereas for O5, you lose the uh, oacetyl, and hence you lose O5 with deoacetylation. So for the talk, there are two general types of conjugates that, that we synthesized. Uh, endling conjugates uh, made by uh, coupling the reducing end of the polysaccharide to fly C. That's done at pH 5 to 7. Uh, we also made lattice type conjugates where you get multipoint conjugation across the hydroxyl uh, the backbone chain to uh, different epitopes on, uh, on the flagellin. That's done at pH 9 to 10. We generated uh, first a lattice type conjugate, and at pH 9 to 10, we lost actually two thirds of the oacetyl groups. When we immunized mice with this conjugate, we found that you, uh, we got a uh, high, higher level antibody against the O polysaccharide relative to PBS controls alone. However, there was a lot of animal to animal uh, uh, disparity in terms of uh, differences for anti OPS titers, and there were several mice that failed to see or convert. In order to distinguish between antibody against the oacetyl groups and antibody against other OPS backbone, backbone epitopes, we uh, undertook epitope mapping, um, uh, looking at ELISA titer against the native oacetylated saccharide as well as the deoacetylated saccharide, and we found that uh, GMTs were approximately the same, indicating the most antibodies actually against backbone, not oacetyl epitopes, uh, which is consistent with the deoacetylation of the saccharide. When we challenged mice with, uh, with, um, that are immunized with these conjugates, we found they were protected against challenge, but protection was not robust. By comparison, sun-type conjugates generated with uh, the native uh, O-polysaccharide, where uh, we retained full O-acetylation, induced very high levels of antibody. So remember, this is linked at the, the core KDO, uh, and you retain all the O-acetyl groups. We found uh, much less animal-to-animal -animal variation for this type of conjugate, where it was end-linked, um, compared to the lattice-type conjugates. And interestingly, um, using the same epitope mapping approach, we found that most, uh, or a good proportion of the antibody was actually directed against oacetyl epitopes. When we challenged mice uh, with uh, Salmonella typhimurium D65, we found a very robust protection against challenge, much higher than we found with the lattice conjugates. And importantly, as uh, shown uh, by that red square on the left-hand side, you know, the mouse that didn't seroconvert is the one that died with, uh, after challenge. In order to uh, further assess uh, whether the uh, differences in, in immunogenicity or protection could be accounted for by either the different conjugate architecture, that's the lattice or the sun-type conjugation, or whether there's loss of the oacetals that contributed to the differential immunogen immunogenicity and protection, we generated uh, uh, conjugates with the native oacetylated polysaccharide or pH 10 deoacetylated polysaccharide 
conjugated at chrom 197 as an irrelevant carrier protein for which uh, no protective benefit would be expected. We immunized mice with these two conjugates, and we found for the uh, native O-acetylated conjugate something similar to the COPS flagellin conjugate, where uh, high antibody titers were induced, consistent uh, um, levels of seroconversion and tight clustering of antibody responses were seen, and once again, uh, antibody was directed uh, in large part to the O-acetyls. For the DO-acetylated polysaccharide, there was a much greater spread in antibody titers, uh, and we found uh, that there was a little difference between, in the geometric mean titer, between native and O-acetylated polysaccharide, indicating that, once again, uh, there's uh, less antibody against O-acetyl groups. When we challenged mice immunized with these two conjugates, surprisingly found that, uh, or as expected, the, the native polysaccharide uh, um, uh, conjugate induced very high levels of protection. No mice died in this challenge. Interestingly enough, the DO-acetylated conjugate also uh, protected a lower to lower level, providing about 70% protection against challenge which was more than we would have expected based on the lattice conjugate. In order to further assess whether or not the differences we were seeing in terms of uh, disparity of protection between these two conjugates could be accounted for by either a qualitative, two more slides, a qualitative difference between uh, the, uh, um, the immune response that was induced or a quantitative difference in total antibody level, because recall the uh, uh, O-acetylated conjugates produced higher total antibody levels as well. Uh, we selected sera that had different uh, anti-OPS epitope specificity profiles in terms of uh, sera that had predominantly anti-OACetal antibodies, sera that had a mix, or sera that had predominantly backbone antibodies. And when we, uh, when we normalized the amount of sera used for a functional antibody assay, looking at SPA or OPA, um, when uh, that antibody, total antibody level against the native polysaccharide was held constant, we found that uh, there was no difference in functional in vitro bactericidal killing activity which would indicate that antibody against any part of the polysaccharide, as long as it binds, is probably effective. Uh, it's uh, the total antibody titer that's more important. Finally, in order to further assess uh, um, the, the effect that O-acetyl groups have uh, on uh, the structure of the polysaccharide, last slide, they, uh, we uh, uh, conducted an, an in silico molecular modeling approach to, uh, to model uh, polysaccharide, in this case a three-repeat O-polysaccharide, both um, with or without O-acetyl groups and when, with or without glucose, uh, glucosylation. And uh, um, to cut to the chase, we found that there's no effect of the O-acetylation or glucosylation on the conformational properties of the O-polysaccharide. And uh, the differential immunogenicity of the uh, O-acetyl groups is probably something biochemically inherent to an interaction between O-acetyls and, uh, and antibodies. Shown on the right-hand side, which I think is a nice way of visualizing the way the immune system probably sees polysaccharides, polysaccharides are not static like proteins. They move around a lot. They have a lot of conformational flexibility. And if you map uh, the total volume taken up by a polysaccharide as it moves uh, in 3D space, and this is over 10 nanoseconds, that is essentially the shape that it assumes, and in this case with the O-acetyls uh, in color painted onto the gray backbone. So uh, in summary, uh, we've identified a uh, an effective salmonella typhimurium glycoconjugate formulation. Uh, we've identified some of the critical quality attributes, mainly um, uh, preservation of oocetals and, uh, and uh, using a sun type conjugate rather than a lattice. So moving forward, uh, we're going to be using this typhimurium conjugate in formulation with a, uh, a comparably optimized intraritidis conjugate and uh, formulated with our partners at Bharat Biotech in uh, Hyderabad, India under funding for the Wellcome Trust with their typhoid conjugate vac vaccine, type R TCV, in a trivalent formulation for sub-Saharan Africa. So as a large contributing team to this work, uh, and funding was from uh, the Wellcome Trust NIH. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I think we'll take uh, two questions. Rafi, very nice, thank you. Uh, two quick questions. Um, uh, first one, did you try conjugating with different lengths of the O antigen? I know you, with the WSB knockout, you generated a uh, lot over expression, you generated that long version. Did you try with shorter as well? And did you do a comparison of the conjugate with the uh, crim and the conjugate with flagellin as uh, carrier? So uh, to answer the first uh, part of the question, we tried with short polysaccharide. That did not work. 
Uh, if you use a polysaccharide that's too long, you'll get poor, poor coupling efficiency as you get steric hindrance of, uh, of adding uh, additional polysaccharide units onto the protein. In terms of a direct head-to-head -head comparison, the same experiment of the COPS fly C and uh, the CRIM conjugate, uh, we didn't do that. They were done in two separate experiments. Could you compare the two? In terms of, uh, well, yeah, I mean, they, they induced, uh, in terms of the O polysaccharide, they induced uh, similar levels of anti-OPS uh, and were both protective. Thank you. So, Rafi, variation yeah. on CALSPER's question. Did the WZZB mutation um, impact the length of the O antigen that you were able to purify and or its O acetylation level from the original parent clone? Okay, so uh, it's, not, it's not a mutation, it's an overexpression of, uh, of WISB. Uh, it uh, definitely affected the length. It, it made it all turn to, to long O polysaccharide. In terms of, of the O acetylation, we didn't assess the O acetyl characteristics of the starting polysaccharide, although we did confirm that uh, the WISB COPS is variably O acetylated in both positions, which is probably the ideal antigen. Andy. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. I just wondered if, uh, following on from Cal's point, the, uh, if, if you think about the, the way that Dennis Casper looked at the, these issues of the ratio between the carrier and the polysaccharide, whether you looked at all at having a higher ratio of carrier protein to the oligosaccharides you're looking at. So more protein to polysaccharide. Uh, we didn't look at that. We actually maximally conjugated um, the protein where we found there's, on average, about four O polysaccharide chains. Per, uh, per carrier protein. We haven't assessed anything less. All right, thank you. Okay, so we have our next speaker who's uh, Fahana Khanan from uh, ICDDRB, uh, uh, um, who's going to talk to us about measurement of LPS specific IGA and IgG avidity maturation in uh, vivotif vaccines. Fahana. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I would like to thank the organizing committee for um, giving me this opportunity to present the findings of our study. Uh, we all know that uh, there are two available licensed vaccines now. One is per, uh, parental VI polysaccharide vaccine, which is not uh, recommended for the children below two years of age. And another one is live attenuated oral uh, TY21A vaccine, which is not recommended below uh, five years of age. In, uh, we have conducted a small study on vivotip vaccine. We opened the capsule. We um, suspended the vaccine in a bicarbonate buffer. And we vaccinated the children two to five years of age. And uh, in ICDDRB, our group, we are also conducting different studies, like uh, on a diagnostic method as well as an, on a immune response of culture-confirmed typhoid fever patients. In order to better understand the immune response to the available and new, uh, new vaccines, we are now evaluating different methods, uh, especially in the patients with blood culture confirmed typhoid fever patients and also in children vaccinated with the vivotif. The methods are bactericidal assay, that means uh, typhicidal assay, opsonophagocytic assay, T cell response, and also antibody AVDT. Today I will talk about the antibody AVDT assay in patients as well as in the vaccines. This is the graph on bactericidal antibody response in typhoid fever patients. And this is, uh, this is the graph of opsonophagocytic uh, response in vaccines and in typhoid fever patients. Uh, today, I will not talk about the, on these two methods, opsonophagocytic assay and also the uh, typhicidal assay. I will talk about the ABDT. So in order to better understand the ABDT, it is important to uh, differ, differentiate uh, to distinguish to, uh, between uh, two similar terminology like affinity and avidity. 
Affinity is, we all know that affinity is the strength of, uh, bind, uh, of epitope with the antigen binding site, and avidity is the overall strength of the affinity with the antigen antibody complex. In a simple way, we can um, say that avidity is the uh, summation of affinity in an antigen antibody complex. So the general idea be uh, behind the avidity ELISA is that the antibodies that are produced in uh, different stages of infections have different affinity and different avidities. Uh, for example, when an individual is in, uh, infected with a pathogen or immunized with a vaccine, immunological response is produced, and the antibodies that are produced at the earlier stage have lower affinity and lower avidity since these uh, antibodies um, these antibodies have not gone through the immunoglobulin rearrangement uh, process. However, if the infection persists, the antibodies undergo maturations, and at the later stage, the antibodies that are produced uh, we, uh, have uh, higher affinity and higher avidity. I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not going to uh, describe the detail of the avidity ELISA briefly, the treatment with the sodium thiocyanate can selectively dissuade the antibodies with low avidity. And this avidity ELISA has uh, different use. Different studies have uh, shown uh, that uh, avidity ELISA can be used to differentiate the primary and secondary infection in uh, different infections like cytomegalovirus, rubella, HIV, toxoplasma gondii, also in cholera and etec diarrheal patients. And this avidity ELISA also used to evaluate the uh, efficacy of vaccine, like influenza vaccine. Briefly, uh, we have treated half of the ELISA plate with sodium thiocyanate, and another half was not treated with sodium thiocyanate. And we used plasma from the same individuals on both sides of the plate. After completion of the avidity ELISA, we have calculated the avidity index. FDT index is the percentage of a, uh, antibodies that remain bound to the uh, antigen coat after, even after treatment with the sodium thiocyanate. So for this study, we have, uh, we have uh, collected plasma from the uh, vaccinees who were two to five years of old, and uh, we have collected blood from them immediately before vaccination, which is uh, defined in the uh, in, in this presentation as a day one, and then day seven and day 21 days after third dose of vaccine. We have also collected plasma from the um, culture positive patients of different age groups, like young children, older children, and adults. And we collected blood from them uh, day of the enrollment, then day seven and day 21 after enrollment. And, uh, this, uh, this slide is showing the plasma antibody response in vaccines, which is measured, which was measured by the uh, normal ELISA. And uh, this uh, slide is showing the plasma antibody response in patients, which was measured by normal ELISA. And uh, uh, you can see both patients and vaccines uh, uh, had uh, plasma antibody response after infection and also after vaccination. And this is uh, the graph of LPS IgA antibody indices in vaccines. And here you can uh, see that the vaccines uh, had uh, significantly higher response uh, on day two and day three when it was compared with day one, that means before vaccination. And this is uh, the graph of LPS IgG antibody avidities in vaccines and uh, the vaccines also uh, had a significantly higher response for LPS IgG when it was compared with the pre-vaccination stage. And this is the graph of uh, Salmonella typhi, culture positive patients. And here you can see we have compared three groups of patients, like young children, older children, and adults. And we did not find any significant difference among three groups at different stages of disease for LPS IgA. Similarly, we did not find any significant avidity 
indices for LPS IgG in uh, different groups of uh, culture positive patients. In conclusion, we can say that uh, even the young children have mounted uh, a antibodies with high ABDT and uh, uh, the, uh, the knowledge regarding this critical uh, protective component in immune response is not, uh, in typhoid fever is insufficient, but the immune response in naturally infected patients is uh, important to know to determine the take rate of vaccines in different populations and also important to determine uh, the response that is needed to be stimulated after vaccination. So, and uh, uh, we, uh, we have also shown that the vaccine has had significantly higher antibody avidity after vaccination. So, um, this avidity ELISA can be helpful to evaluate the immunogenicity for the upcoming conjugate vaccines. Now, we are planning to analyze the other immunological parameters to better understand the functional role role of these antibodies so that we can say which one was which one will be the best method for evaluating the upcoming conjugate vaccine uh, effectiveness and uh, i would uh, like to thank my supervisor dr fredusi kadri and other colleagues from icddrb and also to my uh, to the funding agency like uh, sida foundation and also nih thank you Thanks, Fahana. Questions? I understand that uh, Gordon Dugan is offering a beer to anybody who will answer a question. Um, anybody going to ask a question? Andy. <laughs> he'll, never, he'll never turn down a beer. Well, I, I, I'm not sure whether he'll purchase it. That's my concern, but uh, he'll certainly drink it. Um, Fahana, that, that was very nice. I, obviously, after um, exposure to typhoid, there's a period of time for affinity maturation to happen. And uh, I mean, we don't know the incubation period, in, obviously, in many of the individuals in your group, but it's interesting that it's quite high ability even in the young children early on, whereas maturation should be taking for avidity months rather than, than a matter of days or weeks. So I wonder whether what you're showing is that those children have been previously exposed to infection. Yeah, um, yeah, that's true. Well, we cannot say that the uh, young children have uh, already exposed to typhoid fever or not. And uh, the uh, uh, we have enrolled these patients uh, with the uh, fever with uh, three to seven days, so that we can say that they have already infected with uh, at least for seven days and the immune response is also um, already induced in them. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, your comment is true that uh, we cannot say they, they, ha they are already exposed or not. So. so related to Andy's question, have you um, in any of your vaccinees been able to re-challenge them to see whether uh, you get increase in avidity? So, this is very difficult to say for me because uh, we are not evaluating in the, uh, uh, the vaccines and uh, we are not uh, working on the vaccines to increase the response. So for, uh, we, we have already shown that the immune response in the naturally infected patients, this study result will be helpful for evaluating the take rate of vaccines that for the upcoming vaccines. So. Cool. Yeah, so I think these are really Im incredibly important studies because they're done in an area where people are, are likely to be, uh, you know, the organism is, is its endemic. And so have you thought about, and, and I think we should talk about this a little bit in the context of Tyvac strata, that we could do things like B cell repertoire analysis and more detailed analysis of maturation of the immune response and parallel it with, with the studies that Andy's doing in Oxford using the same SOPs because it would actually be an opportunity really to get to grips with the environmental effects of, of, of people living in the two different uh, uh, geographical areas. Have you, have you thought a little bit about what other assays you may do beyond this? There's such valuable samples you're creating in a controlled environment. We, we just can't afford to miss opportunities. Yeah, this is a very good point. And uh, we did not think about that maybe 
uh, in future we will think and we can plan like we thank you and what if there aren't any other questions uh, thank you very much indeed thank you, thank you. Now the final speaker of the session is um, Enusa Ramin from International Vaccine Institute. The talk is titled Focusing Typhoid Conjugate Vaccine Introduction and Demand in Typhoid Endemic Low and Middle Income Countries. Enusa. Thank you. Good day, seniors and comrades. I'm here to present actually uh, one exercise we actually conducted in the year 2011 and actually finalizing it in 2014. The exercise was conducted by my colleagues, uh, Dr. Vital Mugasale Ilion Park, Chun Sok Yi, and I. And then um, <coughs> to go ahead, actually, yesterday, two of our colleagues in this room actually give a prelude to this work. And uh, coincidentally, their names rhyme actually very nicely. That's Anita and Vinita. Anita <laughs> began by giving uh, what is a, a proposed uh, <coughs> introduction year of uh, 2020, which means 20 year 2020 being a possible year that a TCV will be introduced by one or more countries. And also Vinita, after her presentation late in the afternoon, said it will be good after the business case uh, presentation that someone comes up with any exercise to answer the question when and which countries might introduce any typhoid conjugate vaccine and also how many doses of TCV will be demanded. And I hope with this uh, short presentation to do justice to these two questions. Uh, actually, as part of IVI's policy and economic research uh, of typhoid vaccine investment case, um, we try to bring together some factors in making sense of projecting possible years of uh, TCV adoption. And then in doing this, there were some motivations that actually uh, spurred us on into doing this exercise. One is we know there is or there are some TCV vaccines in the pipeline. And although there have been two uh, WHO pre-qualified uh, typhoid vaccines, which in one way or the other have not been uh, actually so progressive in use due to short uh, duration of protection, and secondly, also due to the fact that they could not be used in children and the five some people reported, and Shu and colleague also reported in children under two years of age. So for that matter, there has been an improved uh, typhoid conjugate vaccine, which probably could be uh, used in solving the two issues that the uh, previous two pre-qualified vaccines will not, couldn't do. Now, on this note, our curiosity was raised to uh, actually look into this issue. Part of the curiosity was what are the TCV candidates and who are their possible developers and manufacturers? Also, what are the expected introduction of the TCV? Like uh, the question Vinita asks, uh, which country and when, and how will the global TCV demand look like? Now, to start with, we look into the, uh, what is it, the landscape of uh, vaccine manufacturers, most of them in the developing countries or within the network of the developing country vaccine manufacturers network. And uh, fortunately for us, some of our colleagues uh, in IVI 
uh, actually came up with a publication which summarized everything nicely. But I will not go into details on this. My colleague from IVI, Dr. Sastrabude Sushant, will uh, elaborate on this tomorrow. But as you can see, we have actually some possible uh, vaccine from Bharat Biotech that could actually head or lead the WHOPQ sometime soon. When we will get to know later. And also, in trying to actually forecast, we try to, we adopted some methodology. We had actually quantitative analysis toppled up with uh, qualitative uh, analysis or qualitative addition. Quantitatively, we use four main indicators. That's looking up to typhoid disease burden and also past vaccine adoption history, immunization system capacity, and uh, experience in typhoid fever research. For typhoid disease burden, actually, we adopted the disease burden analysis conducted by uh, Dr. Moga Saleh and colleagues. And also for past uh, vaccine adoption history, we had actually, uh, we look at a hip vaccine uh, records and then hepatitis B, pneumococcal vaccine, and then rota. We had 93 countries in all in our analysis, but then due to the inner country dynamics in India, we actually splitted India from the uh, 93 countries, for that matter, conducting a separate analysis in itself for India. For that matter, the 92 countries uh, uh, data for hip, uh, hepatitis B, Nemo, and Rota, we actually consulted the uh, John Hopkins uh, School of Public Health uh, IVAC uh, vaccine information management system. And then the immunization uh, for the uh, India, we, for vaccine adoption history, we look up into the pentavalent vaccine introduction in India. And the data was actually uh, accrued from uh, our colleagues from Gavi, uh, we had a personal communication with one of our uh, colleagues, Melissa Ko. I met her here yesterday and I hope she's still uh, in the house. Now, uh, immunization system capacity, we actually look at the DTP3 coverage rates. For the 93 countries, the data were from the WHO immunization system indicator, and for Indian states, UNICEF India gave also a report on the coverage evaluation survey report in 2009. Experience in typhoid fever research, we look up to whether a country had somehow any experience with typhoid research. Is there any surveillance in place? That's one. And two, has there been any clinical trial conducted for ty any typhoid uh, vaccine co candidate, and then has there been a randomized controlled trial or any demonstration uh, trial. Now, this is the methodology, or this is the methodology we adapted. As I said, the four indicators you could see actually up where we have the disease burden, the vaccine adoption history, vaccine infrastructure, and then vaccine experience. Now, for disease burden, we actually uh, use the incidence data as a proxy, and uh, we uh, subdivided the incidence data in uh, uh, what is it, percentiles. Then, on that, any country that has a higher incidence is given actually a score of zero, which means early adoption, and then one means late adoption. And for the rest of the uh, uh, indicators too, we did the same exercise. Then we actually binded everything together into vaccine adoption year score, then years to adapt score, and then base assumption year. Base assumption year is the year in which Gavi supported typhoid conjugate vaccine introduction is expected, but then that is quantitative. We have to consult about 30 experts from 14 organizations to see uh, their subjective opinion on which country might actually introduce early. Based on that, we came with our um, vaccine introduction years. And you can see from here, we have 
two uh, presentation on rapid introduction and slow introduction, which countries might introduce. We say 15 countries might introduce in a rapid scenario and then in a slower scenario, five countries might introduce. So uh, then the demand actually, I have to go quickly. We have a vaccination strategy that we used. And from here we could see that the vaccine demand will actually range from 40 to 65 or 40 to 165 million doses per year. Uh, we have limitations in our um, exercise. Gavi funding shifts some countries that actually are eligible could actually shift out and that could influence decision and other potential intervention could affect decision. Rapid economic growth could lead to uh, interventions in water and sanitation improvement which could change priority. TCV competition with other health intervention including new vaccines will be there and that is all I have for you. Now to take home we say global policymaker uh, donor collaboration is needed in developing policy framework for TCV introduction to meet projected demand. Uh, there will be actually publication coming out soon, so for details you could consult this. Uh, I will not be able to end without actually extending gratitude to our collaborators and uh, also our funders, B uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the government of the Republic of Korea, the government of Sweden, and also some of our colleagues like uh, Denis Dirok, Melissa Ko, and His Henry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Enosa. Now I'll take questions. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Adria Bensiential from WHO. Thanks, Enosa, for that presentation. I just wanted to find out, because I believe when you did that analysis, um, between that time and now, there's been quite a change in the landscape of Gavi eligible countries. So are you looking at adjusting, considering Gavi graduating or graduated countries? That's the first question. And the second one is you, you did mention that you consulted several typhoid experts to add on to the quantitative analysis. But just for the information of the audience, for those who may not be aware, there is another stage that needs to be done as well in order to further refine the expectation of timelines. And that's what usually WHO and, and Gavi would also consult the countries themselves right. and, and, and get country perspectives which may not necessarily come from the qualitative phase that you've done already. So just to keep that in mind, that, that okay. sometimes that changes the timeline a little bit. Right. Thank you, Adjo, for your question. I will tackle the first question first. Uh, the cases during our uh, exercise, we actually conceded that there have been some countries that were about to actually reach the uh, G, uh, GNI per capita limit where they will actually graduate. Countries like Ghana, country like uh, I think Cuba and other countries were part of those. So for that matter, we actually uh, expedited their introduction. So uh, we knew Ghana in 2014 at that time, Ghana was actually graduating, and we knew 2015 Ghana will have actually graduated already. We don't know whether it has happened or it hasn't happened, but we considered that into our analysis. So there is actually a table at the end, which I didn't want to show, but then I might have to show on this. Uh, let me see this. How? Okay. Oh no, it's going back. Which one? We we can speak about it. Offline. Okay, we could speak yeah. about that. There is a table actually I kept in the backup. Oh, I went back. I went back. Okay, Adjo, we will talk about that later. Yeah. Oh no. Yes, please. <laughs> uh, thank you, Anusa, for uh, such a relevant presentation and please. for quoting me. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, tagging along to that question, 
Uh, Gavi graduation is an important factor because the way we've seen it, sometimes it could affect the country's decision to introduce in a negative way in terms of, you know, the the cost, the co-payment cost becomes much higher and they might decide not to introduce. Um, and it appears that in your vaccine adoption um, calculation, you didn't, you did not include this. Am I right? Exactly. So uh, consciously or subconsciously, we had it in, but then indirectly, because uh, if you look up to the vaccines, we actually considered uh, for the adoption history. Most of these uh, vaccines are actually uh, Gavi uh, funded vaccines. And we know for, uh, for sure that actually um, before Gavi, like for hip vaccine, there was actually such a gap in introduction in developing countries. But when, um, when Gavi came and there was actually sponsorship, there was actually a fast introduction in developing countries. So the gap closed somewhere along the line. So most of these things were actually because we the vaccine adoption history from Gavi, then that factor was subconsciously also included in our and final analysis you see that the introduction uh, year forecasting we group them according to the vaccine uh, what is the Gavi funding uh, or Gavi eligibility. Okay. Um, and, and just one final question. I'm afraid you've got two people behind you, oh. so we should uh, <laughs> right. uh, okay. move on. It's all right. okay. uh, yes, very nice presentation. Um, the history of Gavi's uh, vaccine introduction efforts has been uh, marked by many surprises. Uh, the very, very slow, snail-like uh, adoption of HIV vaccines, for example. Uh, the very, very delayed introduction of rotavirus vaccines into Asia. Uh, all of that makes me wonder whether this kind of a forecasting model uh, has uh, requisite validity. Can you tell us a little bit about, the, about how the model itself has been, or the approach, has been validated? Right. Uh, thank you very much, John. Actually, uh, the exercise, when we conducted the exercise, we knew very well um, there will be a lot of limitations in this exercise. Um, for instance, if you look in the limitation, we talked about Gavi eligibility shift. It's one of the major things that could actually change decisions, and there are some factors that are, uh, that are uncontrollable or unmanageable for instance, uh, political, in a country, political instability and natural disasters could change a decision. There could be also, uh, like uh, a colleague in UK, Helen Borchett, in a paper on va new vaccine introduction uh, mechanism, said that vaccine, uh, new vaccine adoption decision is purely political. So for that matter, there are so many things that could actually uh, ma this, this forecast. But all things being equal, we assume that all things being equal on those factors we've held, things could actually go that way. But then uh, a lot of things could change. There is economic growth, and we know very well that typhoid is a disease. Yeah. We know very well that typhoid is a, is a disease uh, when there is sanitation, safe water, and safe sanitation, that disease could actually be kept under control. So if there is economic growth, things can also change. So there are so many things. We still need a lot of work to do on the model we actually use. This is just a trial, an error we're making, but we, uh, all the indicators we use, we use some evidences uh, available so far for us, but some of the indicators are actually out of our hands, we cannot have any control, which can make actually the forecasts actually come into many questions. Thank you, John. Okay, Fine, and very quick I, question. Uh, very quick. Um, yeah. So my comments are mostly for Gates, Gabby, and WHO, because the countries are really trying hard, especially the political leaders, to graduate for the low middle income countries to middle income countries. And these vaccines, especially the typhoid vaccine, conjugate vaccine, got the momentum 
when Gavi declared it is a Gavi vaccine. If they are being graduated, then this all the industries who are, uh, we are hearing the presentations, all of them will be in risk. So are we really ready for that risk or the foundation, Gavi and WHO have any plan for the low middle income country and middle income country in future? Otherwise we'll be facing the same problem that Indonesia and Philippines are now facing with the Gavi vaccine. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, that's it, thank, thank you. So I'd like to finish by um, thanking all of our speakers, not only for keeping to time, but also for presenting fantastic uh, papers. Thank you very much indeed. So we now have time for coffee and uh, posters and reconvene at uh, 3.30. Please do look at the posters. <laughs>